So when I was in college, I had a coworker who asked me to help him move. Uh, we weren't real close, but we did see each other every day. So I thought I should probably help out. Otherwise, things are going to be weird. So I showed up to the house and everything looked normal at first. You know, the moving truck was outside. People were coming in and out with boxes. But when I got inside, that's when I immediately regretted my decision. Because it turns out not everything was put away in boxes. There were still things that needed to be packed. And that's cardinal sin number one in my book, if I'm helping somebody move. But what was more disturbing was all of the white stuff that just covered the floor of every room. You see, this couple, they had this, this little dog with this white, poofy fur. And I don't know what kind of a breed it was, but it must have shed profusely because they're just these little tufts, these little tumbleweeds that just like blew across the floor, like tumbleweeds on a prairie. And like, or, or if, and this was this kind of gross uh, comparison, but if you've seen frost, you know, like that first frost, you look outside, everything's just got this white kind of cover to it. That's what their floor looked like. Just like white everywhere. It was gross. And frankly, I wanted to leave, but it was too late because I'd been spotted and I couldn't just be like, uh, no, see ya. That's not very nice. So I stayed and I just sucked it up. Literally, I sucked it up into my mouth and into my nose and into my eyes. And I had dog hair everywhere. It was gross, y'all. And then a few days later, after they had time to like unpack and settle in, they were really nice and they invited everybody that helped them move over for pizza to express some gratitude. No. No, thank you. I I declined the invitation. I wasn't going to set foot in the house, let alone ingest something into my body, knowing that that little white monster still lived there and was just just fur everywhere. It wasn't going to happen. If you want to enjoy my presence in your home, keep it clean. Pretty simple. And really that idea is the idea behind our message this morning. We started a series a few weeks ago called Bless This House, Bless This Home. The word escapes me right now, I'll admit. Bless this home, we'll say. And the idea here is very simple. We all love our families. We want our homes to be places that are blessed, our families to be blessed. And one surefire way to do that is to make sure that God's presence is found within the walls of our home, that it's found amidst the people of our family. That's something that God yearns for us as individuals to experience as his presence with him. He desires that for our families as well. And Jesus has even given us some some attitudes to cultivate in our lives that invite God's blessing. They're called the Beatitudes. They're found in the book of Matthew chapter five. There's eight of them, but we're gonna focus on one this morning. It's called pure in heart. It's Matthew chapter five, verse eight. It says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. They will see God. You almost might say that his presence will be witnessed by and among them. And that's a powerful concept. It's a concept that's found throughout scripture. And in the Old Testament, especially, God's presence is oftentimes associated with purity. We take a Psalm, for instance, Psalm chapter 23. It goes like this in verse three. It says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? You need to understand that in the Old Testament world, mountains were considered to be holy places. That's where a God's presence was found. And we see this in the Old Testament of the Bible as well. There was Mount Sinai where God appeared to Moses on top of the mountain. The Israelites, before they entered the promised land, they made a covenant on Mount Gerizim, this important mountain. Uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they met on top of Mount Caramel. There's a mountain there. Israel and the temple was built on top of Mount Zion. Like mountains are important places. So basically the Psalm is saying, who can stand in God's presence? It says the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. Pure hearts are important to God. Purity is how we invite God's presence and by extension blessing into not just our individual lives, but into our families and our homes. You might say that if you want to experience God's presence in your home, keep your house clean, so to speak. Keep it pure. But that's a lot easier said than done, especially when we consider the messages that our culture and our world tells us about our hearts. Our, heart would lead, or our, our world would lead us to believe our hearts are already pretty pure and upright. We hear these messages all the time. Just trust your heart, follow your heart, and it won't lead you astray. Your heart knows what's best, just just listen to it. What a crock, if I can just be honest. You know you better than anybody else, which means that you know all of the great things about you in your life, but you also know all of the dark, shadowy parts of your life and yourself that you really don't want anybody else to know about. You know all of the great things that you have done with your life, but you also know all of the not so great things that in your heart you wanted to do. 
And you know all of the great things you've said to and about people, but you also know all of the kind of terrible, awful things that in your heart you wanted to say to or about people in that moment of frustration or that moment of weakness. You know as well as I do, your heart, my heart, the human heart in general is not some upright, pure bastion of light. All of humanity is afflicted by a condition of fallenness called sin. And our hearts without Christ are not pure. In fact, that's a deep, deep foundational theological truth. Without Christ, there is no such thing as a pure heart. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how well you clean up in front of other people. Your heart, my heart, all of us within our chest beats this thing that oftentimes yearns for the crooked. Without Christ, there is no such thing as a pure heart. We've heard these cultural heart sayings, trust your heart, follow your heart, and so on. All right, God has a heart saying as well. It's found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. It might ring a little more true if we stop and think about it. It says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and is beyond cure. Who can understand it? Our world would tell us your heart is pure, your heart is good, just follow your heart. God says, your heart's a dirty liar, don't trust it. And we know that our heart lies to us all the time. Ladies, sometimes for you, it goes like this. I know he's rough around the edges, but I really like him. I can change him. Girl, unless your name's the Holy Spirit, you are not gonna change him, okay? But your heart lies to you. It makes you yearn for it. Fellas, we experience this too. We might, we might say this. I'm not as young as I once was, but I can still fill in the blank. Mm-mm. You know how many thrown out backs and busted knees followed that statement. Your heart says, yes, yes, yes. But fellas, your body's saying, nope, not happening. Our heart lies to us. Our heart is deceptive above all things. And sometimes it's small like that, but, but sometimes it's a little more serious too. In fact, if we were to look at the Proverbs, a book of wisdom that's meant to give us insight for life, here's what it has to say about the heart in chapter 16. Verse two, it says, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Everybody's motives seem pure to them because our hearts are deceptive. Nobody, well, I won't say nobody, hardly anybody wakes up in the morning and says, you know, this very awful, terrible, morally reprehensible thing that I want to do, yeah, I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do it, even though I know it's just a terrible thing. Very few people say that. Most of the time, when it's something terrible, when it's something that hurts somebody else, when it's something that we know is wrong, we will justify it in our hearts, won't we? We'll validate it somehow. We'll make it seem like it's okay. Our heart is capable of deceiving us time and time again, even in some terrible ways. Even children. I know we all have to think about children, these little balls of light. They're not. They're crooked, just like you and me. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11. Even small children are known by their actions. So is their conduct really pure and upright? Living, breathing example of this. My son, my three-year-old son, loving to pieces. I came home for lunch Monday. I walk in the kitchen, he yells, daddy! And he runs into my arms and jumps into him. And you're thinking, well, that's sweet. And then immediately, doosh, he throat punches me right there in the kitchen. Unprovoked, full malicious intent, went straight to his room. My son is great, but he's not a little bastion of purity and light. His heart is fallen, just like my heart is fallen, just like your heart is fallen. All of humanity, we suffer from this condition called sin, and it causes our deceptive hearts to beat and yearn for something crooked. Without Christ, there's no such thing as a pure heart. Without his redemption, without his spirit filling us, changing us, sanctifying us, showing us truth, showing us God's will, revealing to us and compelling us to follow his love, we cannot trust our hearts. Now, I've kind of made light of this a little bit up to now, but there's a very serious theological truth here. We read about it in the book of Ephesians chapter four. And we're gonna spend quite a bit of time in Ephesians this morning. So if you wanna open up your Bibles and follow along, this would be a good point to do that. Ephesians chapter four is where we're gonna be. If you don't want to open up your Bible, you can continue to follow on the screens or you can download the FCC Mammoth app on your mobile device. Click the Sunday button and you'll find all the scriptures and sermon notes pulled up ready for you to use. So Ephesians chapter four, this is the apostle Paul, somebody charged by God with spreading the gospel in the ancient world. This is Paul talking about the condition of the heart 
of those who have yet to be redeemed by Christ, that fallen condition. So here's what he has to say. He says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they're full of greed. Now there's a lot to unpack in that passage. We're not gonna do that this morning. Instead, I just wanna zero in on what's applicable to our subject matter today. There is a condition of the heart here that is responsible for a lot of the other things happening in this passage. It's a hardening of the heart. And this hardening of the heart, it happens after a long time of hearing God's voice and ignoring it, sensing God's call and denying it, witnessing his commands and instructions and shushing them. Over a prolonged period of denying God and ignoring God in our lives and not giving him that that call and that authority, our hearts begin to grow calloused and hard. Much in the same way that our skin, if it's irritated again and again and again and again, you develop a callus there and your skin becomes less sensitive to the pain and to the sharpness of whatever irritation is responsible for that. In the same way, our hearts become less responsive to the sharpness of God's truth and God's word. They become calloused. And when that happens, there are some things that begin to inflict us in our lives. And they're listed here a little bit. This passage says that that such hearts are darkened in their understanding. If you've ever been, well, you've been in your bedroom, obviously. If you've been in your bedroom with the lights on, it's very easy to navigate. You know where the bed is. You know where the nightstand is. You know where the pile of laundry is. You know where all the stuff in your bedroom is. And as long as the lights are on, you can navigate that pretty easily without running into anything. But when that room is darkened, your field of vision goes, and you can see maybe a foot or two in front of you. And it's not always easy to see where the furniture is. It's not always easy to see where the pile of laundry is. It's not always easy to see the hazards in your own bedroom. And so you end up just kind of groping around in the darkness, hoping you don't stub your toe and break it at 2 a.m. And that's kind of what happens in life. When we have God's truth illuminating this world around us, we can see the twists and the turns. We're not really taken by surprise when things start to unfold. We know how to navigate the difficulties of life. But when our understanding is darkened, We begin groping around through life, just kind of hoping we don't bump into anything and invite too much pain into our lives. God has given us his truth and his word and his commands for a good reason. It's for our benefit. But when our hearts become callous to those words, our understanding becomes darkened. We see other things start to happen as well. We begin to indulge, okay, in impurity. That's the thing that we're trying to avoid, isn't it? Because blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. We want to invite God's presence. And we've seen that that happens through having a pure heart and clean hands. But when we begin to invite impurity into our lives, we're just not making that room for him. We become less and less sensitive to the shame of sin and to the shame of darkness. It's kind of like coffee in some ways. You know, when you first, anybody in here, when you first had your very first cup of coffee, who enjoyed it? Honestly, honestly. A couple of weirdos, that's okay. No, I love you. I love you guys. Okay, here's the thing. Most people, when they have that very, very first cup of coffee, find it to be very bitter, but you keep drinking it. And the longer you drink it, the less bitter it seems until eventually you kind of acquire a taste for it. And then it starts to taste good. And then you wind up like me with a problem where you polish off one of those coffee bar thermoses by 1, 8, 1 p.m. every day. Like it is a real issue. Okay, we have a support group. You can come join me if you want. Coffee is one of those things. You can acquire the taste and then it it actually seems pretty good. Sin is the same way and impurity is the same way. When we start to indulge, when we invite it into our lives, pretty soon it stops being shameful. It stops hurting. We might start to enjoy it and we're just indulging in impurity as our passage describes. We're closing ourselves off from God's presence and the blessing that follows from that. This is the downward spiral of those who follow their heart and lean on their own understandings. Our hearts are not inherently good. And we will not build a home that invites God's presence and blessing by following our hearts. We will build that home by following Christ, by building a Christ-centered home where his truth and his word and his spirit are the foundations of who we are, not a home that simply tacks him on the side. (laughs) thought the Holy Spirit was speaking there. A Christ-centered home is how we invite God's presence. 
And there's a, a truth to that that's found even in the Psalms, in Psalm 119. I want you to listen to this. This is verse nine. And, and young people in particular, and take that as you will. If you feel young at heart, you listen to this too, because there's something in here for everybody. It says this, it says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to their hearts and following where, oh no, that's not what it says at all, is it? How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. You see, the key to finding this life, this culture of purity, to building that in our own individual lives and in our homes is not by following our wayward hearts that lead us astray. It's by building a foundation on Christ. That is how we establish a culture of pure heartedness in our families. Now, what are some practical things we can do to build a foundation on Christ and start building that foundation? All right, let me give you a few practical ways that we can build a culture of purity in our homes. The first one's very simple. Fix your heart. Get your own heart right first. I know that seems very obvious, but, but sometimes we miss that. We wanna build this culture of pure heartedness in our homes and yet our own hearts, we're harboring impurities in them. I can't lead my family to someplace I have not yet been. You can't lead your family to someplace you have not yet been. Parents, adults, spouses, if you want to build that culture of pure heartedness in your home, whether it be you and your spouse, you and your kids, you and your grandkids, whoever, it starts here in your own heart. I wanna turn back to Ephesians chapter five for a minute. This is just a few verses after what we just read. Ephesians chapter five, verse three says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this, you can be sure no immoral, impure, greedy person, such as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Our passage makes very clear. There are things that are out of place and are out of character for those who have devoted themselves to Christ. It's not that we receive grace and now we get to do everything we wanna do because we're gonna be forgiven regardless of that. There are things that are out of step. Impurity has no place in our hearts. And some of the things listed here are obvious. Sometimes impurity is very obvious and we can guard against it easily. The example that's given here, sexual immorality. That's usually, usually not the kind of thing that just kind of leaps out from the bushes and gets you. Like you don't wake up naked next to some woman in your bed and go, you're not my wife, who let you in? Like that, that doesn't happen. You don't wind up with a folder filled with pornography on your mobile device and go, hold, hold the phone. I thought I was just playing Angry Birds this whole time. Nobody has ever said that, all right? A lot of times, sexual immorality is something we see coming a mile away. It's something that we can take steps to guard against. But sometimes, sometimes impurity is a little sneakier. And sometimes it does weasel and worm its way into our hearts because it's a lot more subtle. And there's some examples of that in here too. You may have picked up on it. It says obscenity, foolish talk, which would be foolish in a biblical sense. Foolish meaning it has disregard for God. Coarse joking, dirty jokes. If I were to ask you, could you describe for me somebody whose life is out of sync with God and who has welcomed impurity into their life? These probably wouldn't even make your top 10 list, would they? Because they're words. And a lot of times in our culture, we downplay the significance of words. They're just words. They're not hurting anybody. I'm not like cussing somebody out. I'm not being angry or, 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 or vicious towards somebody. They're just words. Jesus has a slightly different take on words though. He lays it out for us in the book of Luke chapter six. He says this in verse 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Listen to this. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, these things coming out of our mouth, these are not just words. These are a reflection and an overflow of what's filling this. Our heart is filled with things continually. It fills to the point of overflow and whatever overflows, that's what we hear. That's what we hear represented. And so if I have impurity coming out of my mouth, if I have these things, obscenity, this foolish talk that denies God, this coarse joking, 
that should give me pause. And I should ask myself, wait a minute, what is going into my heart? What am I entertained by? What am I finding joy and levity in? When I sit down and I turn on the television or I open up a book or my web browser for entertainment and I let my guard down, what am I letting in my heart? That's a good question because it's gonna fill us. It's gonna take root. It's gonna overflow out of our mouth. It's going to affect us in ways maybe we didn't, didn't realize. Impurity has that power. Great example of this. My, my new obsession right now is something called the Flat Earth Society. It's a group of people that sincerely believe that the world is flat and that there is a vast conspiracy through the government and the church and everybody else to cover it up, but they alone have discovered the truth. The earth is flat. I love this. I don't know why it's so entertaining to me, but I just, I'm so tickled by all this. So anyway, this is my new fascination. I was watching a documentary on it a few months ago and it was about people that discovered this theory. And, and as they were interviewed, I noticed this theme started to show up. Every one of them, when they were asked, how did you come to believe that the earth was flat? Every one of them started off saying, at first I thought it was crazy, right? Everybody knows the world is round. But then I started to read some books and I started to watch some movies. And I started to listen to some more people. And the more I watched and the more I listened and the more I read, the more sense it made until one day I was convinced. I said, this is the truth. In other words, the more that they exposed themselves to this idea, the stronger hold it gained over their heart and their mind. Now, let me ask you this. If it is capable for sound, sane, educated people to believe that the world is flat because they've been exposed to something repeatedly, is it so hard to believe that repeated exposure to impurity in our lives won't lead us astray somehow? Is it so hard to believe that repeated exposure to impurity might actually convince me that that very racist and offensive joke that demeans people made in the image of God is okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Is it so hard to believe that repeated exposure to impurity might lead me to believe that that graphic display of sex and violence on my television screen is just fine and dandy, that God is pleased with that? Is it hard to believe that repeated exposure to impure and foolish talk of those who would deny God in so many different ways and, and would oppose his commands and his truths in so many different venues and avenues, that that might somehow shape my own heart and pull me away from it? It happens every day, guys. We need to guard what goes in here. We don't need to follow our heart. We need to protect our heart because what it is filled with will overflow out of our mouths, into our minds, into the ears and the hearts of other people. If we want to establish a culture of purity in our home, amongst our spouse, amongst our kids, we got to protect our own hearts because I can't lead them someplace I have not yet been myself. It's very simple. If you want to build that culture, get your heart right. Guard it. Protect it. Heed the warning that Paul gives us in verse six. Don't listen to those that would say that this is no big deal. For because of such things, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. God cares about purity. He longs for you to have a pure heart because he longs to make his home in your heart. Purity matters. That's one, get your own heart right. Here's a second one. And this one is really specifically for parents. If we wanna build a culture of purity in our homes, parents, parent to the heart of your children. Parent to the heart of their children. I'm finding myself falling into this trap lately. A lot of times we've, we've become very focused on behaviors. Do this, don't do that. You can do this thing, don't do this thing. You ought to do this, you should not do that. Okay, we become very behavior focused. It's easy to forget sometimes that behaviors overflow out of our convictions. The state of our heart will go so far in informing the way that we live and act as people. The same is true with children. And Jesus tries to, to instruct us and, and help us realize this through an interaction he has with a group of Pharisees in the book of Matthew chapter 23. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish and then the outside will be clean as well. I have to tell my wife this all the time. I do the dishes and she'll bring a pot in and she'll say, did you clean the outside of this pot? And I'll say, Jesus told me just to clean the inside and the outside would be clean as well. And she gives me this look, y'all, like, 
if God doesn't smite you, I'm going to. Like, yeah. It, no, obviously Jesus was not talking about dishes. He's talking about our hearts and our lives. And he's telling these Pharisees, these Pharisees at this time, they're very focused on behaviors. If I do the right things, I can please God. If I just check all the boxes, God will be satisfied with me. Outwardly, they were very obedient. But as Jesus points out, their hearts were still messed up. They had outward obedience with inward rebellion. And he instructs them, he says, first clean up your heart, have purity here, and your actions will reflect that. You won't have to worry about trying to do all the right things because it will overflow from the cleanliness and the purity of what's inside you. Parents, we can take that same advice and apply it to our kids because there's going to come a day, some of us are already there, when our kids will not care what you have to say about their behavior and their likes and their dislikes. Teenagers are wonderful, beautiful creatures, but they are incredibly difficult to work with. Are they not? Can I get an amen? Okay, we got one, thank you. Teenagers, they do not care what you have to say, parents. I worked with them for a number of years. And in that instance, that's when we need to remember that our heart, their heart is what we need to teach, what we need to reach, because from that heart, their actions are gonna overflow. And from that day on, they're really not gonna be too concerned about what you say they should and should not do, ought, ought not do. But if we can shape their heart, if we can parent to that heart, that's how we will inform their decision-making and their behavior for years and years and years to come. Parent to the heart. Here's one last piece of advice. Pursue perfect purity of the heart. If you want to build this culture of pure heartedness in your family, pursue perfect purity of the heart. And you may be hearing that saying, really? Perfection? That's what I have to get? I didn't say you were going to attain it, okay? But I said, aim for it. Don't tolerate or settle for anything less than perfect purity. Because by definition, anything less than perfect purity is impurity. Is it not? I mean, if I have 100 jelly beans and 99 of them are wonderful flavors like raspberry and toasted marshmallow, but I have that one black licorice jelly bean in my bag, the whole thing's ruined, isn't it? That one flavor that has come straight from the depths of hell, that is just ruins the whole thing. Now, a little bit of impurity ruins the whole thing. Maybe a better example of this. This last summer, my family and I, we were in the backyard and we were playing outside. I have wonderful, wonderful neighbors, but my neighbors are not always wonderful about keeping track of their animals. And so one of them got into my backyard and messed in my yard. And I found it, of course, right on the bottom of my shoe. And it smelled. So I went to the hose and I rinsed it off and, and then we just went about our business. But that smell just like lingered and stayed there. And I was getting frustrated because I couldn't find it. I checked my shoes again. I checked my son's shoes. I checked my wife's shoes. I checked my son's pants because he wasn't potty trained at the time. Like I was looking everywhere because that smell was, uh, was infuriating. Finally, I, I found it. On the bottom of my shoe, there's this, this little bitty piece of poop kind of wedged in the creases in the tread that just didn't get rinsed out. And that little bit of poop just went a long way in ruining the experience. So let me ask you this. When it comes to your heart, how much poop are you willing to tolerate? Because a little bit goes a long way, doesn't it? A little bit of impurity will go a long way in tainting the purity of your home. Allowing just a little bit of ungodliness, tolerating just anything a little less than holy in your home is going to open the gates for a lot of disappointment. You're not going to get it. You're not going to attain perfection, okay? That's why we have and we celebrate the grace of God. We have this promise from God that even though we fail, he picks us up. He washes us clean in the blood of Jesus. We have this second chance to do it over and to do better. He empowers us with the spirit to try again and to find success. We're going to have to enjoy the grace of God again and again and again. But that doesn't mean we should settle for anything less than perfect purity in our homes. Now, some of you are hearing this. And you're saying, yes, I want this. I want to have this culture of purity because I want to invite God's presence. I want to experience that blessing. I want the kind of home we saw in that video at the beginning where people are celebrating God and not chatting back and forth about all the drama in their lives. But I have a problem because I have followed my heart and I'm reaping the consequences of that. Or, or, or I, have, I have allowed something less than perfect purity to, to establish itself in my home or I've not parented to the heart of my children and they're teenagers now and, and I'm starting to have trouble. I don't know what to do. And, and I want this, but is there any hope for me? Can I right this ship? 
I want to share one last passage with you this morning before we close, if that's you. This is spoken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. And God is talking to the Israelites, a people who had rebelled against him in every way, a people whose hearts had been hardened and callous to him and his truth, people whose understanding had been darkened, people who had indulged in the impurity, people who had wandered off the reservation. And he speaks to them these words. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He speaks this promise to this group of people if they will just turn to him. And that same promise is spoken to us in the promise of Christ. If we just turn to him, not tack him onto the side of our lives and continue to do as we please and follow our hearts, but if we build our lives on him, as our Lord and our Savior, if we put our hope and all of our chips into his camp of saying, you're, you're, you're the one, I'm going all in on you. If we build that house on him, there is this promise God gives. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. It'll be my spirit. And he will empower you to walk in holiness and obedience. And this new heart will be capable of being forgiven and healed. It will be capable of purity. And I will lead you on that path if you turn to me and put your trust in Christ. That's the hope that we have. No matter how far we may have wandered, no matter what shape our family may be in, whether it's great, whether it's mediocre, whether it could really stand some home improvement, our house can be blessed if we turn to him. Blessed are the pure of heart for they we'll see God. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for the families in this room and the families that are represented here. And Father, my prayer for them is just that you, you would guide us, that you would change our hearts. In some cases, I pray that you would rend our hearts and break those hearts of stone and callousness, that we may experience and know your word is true and we might yearn for you and your ways. For some of us, Father, we are following you. I pray that we would be encouraged that we would continue to cling to your word and build our lives on you, to put our trust in you, to experience your blessing and your presence. And for those of us who are searching, Father, and those who are, are kind of just groping around in the darkness trying to put the pieces together, I pray that you bring clarity, that your spirit would speak to them, that you would reveal yourself to them in such a way that they would know your love and know your grace and your truth, that they might choose Christ and to build their life on him. Lord, I pray for each and every one of these people here today that you would bless their home as they seek after you. And it's in your name we pray, amen.